everybody. Uh, welcome to the another hangout, another or live Hubble hangout at the um, American Astronomical Society's 225th meeting. Today we are at the Space Telescope Science Institute booth, and we are going to talk about Hubble, uh, the some of the unexpected discoveries, some of the things that Hubble has given us, some of the things that we didn't expect to see from Hubble, and things like that. And, and there, these are members of a panel that's going on actually right now, uh, where they're talking about these things. We're going to have some members of the panel come down and join us. But unfortunately, like I said, the panel's running a little bit late. So they haven't gotten down here yet. And so uh, we had the very good luck, however, of uh, Mart actually, uh, poor, poor Martin. Mar Dr. Mar Doc Dr. Martin Star Barstow from the Royal Astronomical Society had stopped by our booth to say hi to us. And then I said, <laughs> I said, hey, why don't you come talk to us? You may remember he was in a hangout early, or late last year where he talked to us about um, the ATLAS mission, or which is now being called the High Def Space Telescope, High Definition Space Telescope uh, mission that was going on or is being planned right now. Um, so before I get started, I want to remind you that we're look if, if you want to ask questions, Hubble Hangout is the hashtag to use on Twitter. We're also doing it on YouTube, or the YouTube event page, or the YouTube page where this is being broadcast. We're looking at your comments as well as the G Plus event page that we posted this on. So please send some questions in or comments, and we will read them. I have a person in my ear, Elena. She's awesome, telling me uh, what you're saying. So uh, I, I will repeat them in the Hangout and uh, read them out to you, and hopefully get some answers. So, and also with me is Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute as well. She's the Hubble Outreach Scientist. Hi, Carol. Hey. Okay, so Martin, I know you were, you just, you just <laughs> flew in. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I apologize you, for the jet lag. <laughs> yeah. But it's, this, is, this is a little bit fortuitous because earlier today, at around noon, uh, 1230, I think, uh, NASA had their big town hall, and they outlined all of their budgets and, and what they're uh, working on and the status of a variety of things and, and where things lie in this. It was mostly the science mission directorate, though, right, Carol? Yes, yes. That's the main audience here is the astrophysics part is, is best tuned to the audience at the Ast uh, American Astronomical Society. Right. So they always come and tell us what they're thinking um, and then what we have to do to actually match our science goals to what their budget might be. So they always give us a little bit of advice about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so NASA's, this isn't the part that deals with human spaceflight, for example. So they don't talk about Orion, or they don't talk about any of that, any, or, you know, uh, Earth science, or the space station, things like that. It's just the astrophysics division and the priorities there, of which JWST falls under uh, the purview Hubble Space Telescope does. Um, and now they're starting to get to thinking about what's going, W first is the next thing after JWST. That's the big mission. We talked about that in the hangout earlier today. And now they're talking about what's coming next. And they're thinking about this, what, at last or high definition. Well, I, th I think the big thing for me, I, when I'm over in the States, I like to come to these events because it, it's good to get an idea of what NASA is thinking. Because I work with the European Space Agency. Right. And what we need to try to do is join up the thinking, yeah. which we haven't, if we're honest, done that well in the past. Uh, and when things get so expensive uh, as we're going for bigger missions, we've got to collaborate more to share the costs out so that we can do the science that we really want to do. So I think the, the headline was the planning for the next decadal survey, which seems a long way away because it's only 2015 right now. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's putting in the legwork so that when that comes around in five years' time, the appropriate large projects... Uh, of which I hope at last or high definition space telescope will be one, are actually at a, a better stage of preparation because if we do nothing between now and then, then there'll be nothing to look at and to evaluate for that decadal survey. And therefore, it'll be another decade before these missions get a chance. And then these, it gets well, well beyond the lifetime of my career. <laughs> Uh, and possibly others. So it really is important to get that planning in place and get the exercise done. Yeah, and uh, what NASA did today, or at least what Paul Hertz in his presentation did today, was he outlined big picture boxes that he would that he wanted these projects to uh, to fall in. Th this project, whatever it ended up being. Uh, they, the, the, what they were looking for. What did you think of that? There were a lot of synoptic things, a lot of exoplanets, things like that. Yeah, they're, they're, a lot of it seemed to be focused on surveys as well. And I, yeah, I, yeah. Surveys are really important, but I, I'm not entirely convinced in my own head that the next large NASA mission should be a survey. 
But it does depend what you mean by survey. Do you mean a survey of things that you already know about or a survey to discover new things? Uh, certainly the, the idea of at last fulfills probably two of the things that were actually suggested. The imaging of terrestrial exoplanets is certainly something that's within the capabilities of that. But then there was a separate uh, category for UV optical IR survey. But without saying much about what that was, I mean, again, at last fulfills that role. One of the things that I was a bit concerned about, there was also a big X-ray survey. And since those of us in Europe... That was one of the boxes he had outlined, an X-ray survey. Yeah. I've just basically put Athena on the line as the next large ESA mission uh, towards the end of the next decade. That seems to be a bit of so we say non-joined up thinking potentially going on there that actually we should be doing one x-ray mission that we all share in rather than maybe two and I'd be a bit concerned that, that there was separation and, and drift of these projects. G give us a, just a, a brief description of Athena, what, what is it going to be? So Ath Athena will be a, a very large focusing x-ray telescope with an imaging spectrometer on board uh, the spectrometer will be a, a cryogenically cooled device so, so that instead of dispersing the light, which we normally do in the UV, for example, or in the visible, to create a spectrum, the detector itself has energy resolution built in and it can measure the energy of the photon that it detects. The problem with these kind of devices that have been used for a while in X-ray astronomy has been how good is that spectral resolution. And these new cryogenically cooled devices uh, have extremely good spectral energy resolution, which means that you can make a very efficient system if you don't have to spread the light out in the focus. So, so it will be it won't be a survey mission in the sense of it will be looking at the whole sky, but it will be pointing at lots and lots of groups of interesting objects and observing in time and in energy to understand the physical processes going on. And, and is the time scale for this mission the 2020s, or what's the time scale? The time scale is a bit imprecise, but it will be more likely 2030 than... Oh, oh, okay. 2028 is about the earliest scale. So, so it actually is fairly compatible with a decadal survey in the US as well, which will be looking towards the end of the following decade. A, a, decadal, a decadal survey in 2020 is looking towards 2030. That's right. uh, and that's about the time scale we expect for the launch of Athena. Yeah, I see what you mean about this sort of, you know, it, so it does seem to fall in a very similar box that what NASA was talking about today. Yeah. Hopefully they'll get, they'll get to talking <laughs> to ESA or something. Well, I don't they know. need to be doing it before the decadal survey, of course, is sorted out in that context because Athena will be being built towards the end of this decade. We're, we're still designing, planning. It's still not fully approved, but that process will take two, three at the most four years and then the mission will start in anger and if people are going to join in they need to be joining in soon so that ESA know what the contributions are going to be and can manage their budgets appropriately as well. Well the uh, so getting back to at last then will there do you think I mean I'm, I'm just gonna say for the sake of discussion sort of go as if this is going to be one of the higher priority things in the decadal study so let's say that that you know, at last, or a mission very similar to it uh, is the one that's going to happen. Uh, will there be a lot of ESA, NASA uh, cooperation in that? I don't think you can guarantee it because, again, ESA has a planning process with, in which we have to work. But I would expect that ESA would be a major participant in the way they, they participated in Hubble and in the James Webb Space Telescope. I don't think ESA has the capability of leading a mission like that because we, we don't have the technology for building the large optics. While we can do large X-ray optics, large UV OIR optics is, is a difficult, different kind of problem, and we don't have the track record. But providing instruments, providing other infrastructure support is something ESA can do. And I think there's quite a lot of appetite within ESA for playing the same kind of role that we played in those earlier missions. Okay, and... and, and uh I think for the sake of these surveys we're talking about, they, you know, that seemed to be a big priority in the, in the talk today. Uh, these are, I, I guess the way to think of them is they are, like, as you said, they're covering the entire sky. They're generally wide field, right? Things like that, high resolution. Um, and Mark Postman was telling us this morning that they're hoping to be able to image and 
detect, not just you know, infer, these Earth-like planets with water signatures on them. Yes, that, that's why you need a big telescope, yeah. because you've got to be able to resolve in very close to the parent star. And it's that spatial resolution that's so important. But the physics of resolving anything in a telescope dictates that you have to make the aperture large and use as short a wavelength as you can. And so the UV is the key to doing a lot of that work. And right now, and Carol, uh, a lot of people were concerned, not just at this talk, but at uh, yes, at the uh, UVOIR session earlier this week, that Hubble right now is the only game in town when it comes to UV, isn't it? There's nothing else. That's true, and in fact, we've seen a little bit of a change of the applications for observing time because people are realizing that James Webb is not going to do the ultraviolet, um, and W first may not do much either. And so this is like our last shot at looking at some of the UV aspects of important parts of astrophysics. And then we're going to go into an epic where it's more visual and infrared. And then hopefully if we do at last or HDST, um, we'll get some UV capability as well because there's a lot of astrophysics that goes on yeah. in the UV. And there's going to be a big... It's, impor it's important. Yeah, because I think if we don't do anything to Hubble and it just stays where it is, and, and let's assume everything works perfectly, there's still orbital problems with Hubble that would make, not let it stay up there for much long past 2025, right? It's got, it's got to have a limited life. Uh, you can't, can't go and repair it again. No. <laughs> it would be nice and boost the orbit again. I, I think we have to accept that the lifetime of anything like that is ultimately limited by how long the systems will keep on going. And even uh, if they do work perfectly, yeah. there's still the orbit to and consider. Th this is why the decadal process is important and that we need to back out, you know, if we're going to have a decadal report in 2020, we need to back down a couple of years. We have to do studies, science cases, really say, okay, from space, um, and from the ground, what kind of science are we doing today? Where do we think we're going to be in 10 to 15 years? And what are the capabilities needed? And, and then you have to study that. You have to do simulations, computer modeling. You have to look at your technologies. Will your technologies um, mature fast enough? So it's, it's a long process that the community has to be involved in, um, not just doing their personal research today and then someday on January 1st, 2020, voila we have a report so there's a lot of work that goes into it and this uv question i think is going to be you know one of the things that has to be looked at right and it's important to remember folks you can't do this from the ground it's got to be done in space so we've got to we've got to put it in the queue if we're gonna if we're gonna be able to do this at all in the future so martin i know you i'm gonna let you go here in just a minute because i know that you just stopped by to say hi but and i really thank you for taking yes, time yeah, out yes, by the way <laughs> but uh maybe this is a speculative question but w W first, W first is going to be in orbit in, in geosynchronous orbit over the Earth. Is there any sense of where this this new uh, atlas might go? Well, I'm I'm probably not the best person to ask, but I would expect it will be going out to L2, something like that. Okay. So it needs to be in a deep orbit where you have long observing times, where you don't have to interrupt those observing times due to the Earth occultations. Uh, so as far as I know, that's the current plan. Yeah, that, that would make sense too. L2 is a pretty popular spot. So, Martin, thank Martin Barstow, Thanks thank you so very much. much. That'll, that'll this was a lot of fun. To come by. Yeah, <laughs> if you see a camera, well, it'll teach him to be late as well. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you stopping by. It's always That's a pleasure. Okay. It's, a great, it's a great pleasure. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thanks so much. And look for another invite, invite for another. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll be back to you. Okay. No, we'll be back to you. We'll get you again. Yes, we'll have him back in a hangout. So with us now is uh, joining us is uh, Kenneth Sembach. He is the uh, you're the project manager, the project, the the whole manager mission, mission head. head. That's that's the right title. Thank you uh, for the Hubble Space Telescope uh, at the institute. And uh, he's just came from the panel where they were discussing um, all of the accomplishments of the uh, both past and looking towards the future of the Hubble Space Telescope. And Ken had the <laughs> unenviable task of, of, in a few minutes, talking about all the unexpected discoveries that Hubble has mm -hmm. given us uh, over the years. And uh, you did a pretty good job, I must say. I don't know. <laughs> I, only I only covered a few of them, I think. <laughs> there's, there's a lot. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. So when you build something like this, Ken, they, these things get uh, 
you don't know what you don't know, I guess, right? And so you start looking and you say, well, well what is that? I want to talk specifically about the Hubble Deep Field, the original one. Was that, the, I've always portrayed that as a really risky sort of a risky move on the part of the, the Institute or the director's discretionary time because they didn't know what they would see when they looked at that, there, right? Uh, that's exactly right. They didn't know what they would see. And in fact, there were many astronomers who believed it was going to be a waste of time. And it was a lot of time. It was 10 days, right? Yeah, and it was a lot of time. And they, there were actually prominent astronomers in the field in the director's office telling him, you know, don't do this. Really? Right? You're, you're going to waste time, and time on Hubble is precious. And fortunately, the director had the good sense to, to carve his own path and to move forward with it. Okay. So, and, and the, uh, uh, what did they think was going to happen? Did you see nothing? Yeah, uh, there were people at the time who didn't believe that um, galaxies would look all that different um, than they do today, that they would simply just get fainter with time, and that eventually you wouldn't see them. You wouldn't see them at large distances because they would be too faint to see. And Hubble showed brilliantly that not only can you see them at large distances, but they look very different than they look today. So the whole field of galaxy evolution really opened up and now we know that, in fact, Hubble can see galaxies not quite back to the beginning of time, but to within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. And um, those galaxies are organized. Uh, they contain stars. They're assembled. And so they're not even the first galaxies. That, um, you know, James Webb will be looking at the first galaxies, hopefully. Um, but, you know, Hubble really paved the way to be able to look back that far. And the subsequent deep fields that occurred since that first deep field back in the mid-1990s, have just been pushing further and further back with Hubble as time goes on. And my more parochial comment about this is if the director of the Space Telescope says, hey, we're going to spend 10 days on something, this is what <laughs> I think we should do, you can bet there's a cue out his office saying, you know, maybe we should do this, right? So, so we have a big community out here, and they have lots of opinions, so, you know, everybody had something they were interested in. So, right. yeah, so maybe, we had to get a consensus that, yeah, this is really edgy, but we should do it. Yeah, maybe we should explain a little bit, too, about what we're talking about with this discretionary time. The director of the Institute gets a certain amount of Hubble time, right, that he can do anything he, went, anything he wants. Right, so it's director's discretionary time. So each cycle, there's a certain amount of time that he is able to just use um, for special programs like the Deep Field or to entertain proposals from the community out of the normal you know, out of cycle with the normal proposal round um, to do observations of new things that happen to come up or new discoveries that are made that need some kind of Hubble observations to be made. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's called director's discretionary time for a reason. That being said, um, the directors typically ask um, a group of scientists, both internal to the institute and external, to look at those requests for observing time. No, he, he's not saying, I, I'll, I'll give it to my best friend here and this person here, or, or the first 30 that ask, or whatever the, the metric would be. He's actually taking that, you know, has, has taken that very seriously over the years. All of the directors have. And um, it turns out that the time awarded through this process is actually some of the most um, impactful in the literature. That is... That is that the observations that get taken as part of the director's discretionary time often become some of the most cited results in the literature once those results are published. And that shouldn't be too surprising given that they're typically discoveries, something new, something that might open up another area of discovery. Um, you know, things that are really right at the cutting edge, the things that are kind of hard and not common. And so those kinds of things often get a lot of scrutiny in science because those are the kinds of things that have a way of making transformative changes to your thinking. What does that say about the uh, time allocation process? I mean, doesn't that mean, does that mean, does that suggest that people are giving proposals ordinarily that are kind of safe and not as maybe ground bust, groundbreaking? There's some of that, but there are certainly groundbreaking proposals that come in as well. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's often easier uh, to choose things that are a little bit riskier, that are a little bit more cutting edge, when you have a small group of people deciding 
whether or not that particular effort should go forward as opposed to a very large panel of people. Also, historically, a lot of the director's discretionary time is parsed out in very small chunks of time. And so um, any given observation might be only a few orbits, a few hours of HST time, whereas in the larger, um, the, the larger proposals that are in the panels that get submitted yearly, um, those tend to be you know, tens of orbits, hundreds of orbits in some cases. Um, and, and with the case of frontier fields, even more. Yeah, in the case of the frontier fields, we're spending um, 850 orbits or so over three years um, to do that program. And we're hoping to get... Oh, go well, I was going to comment that if people remember our Hangout, that we once talked about how the time is allocated, and there are these panels. So if you have some risky observation, say, in um, star formation, then that has to get past that panel, but then the panel chairs go and then they talk about, well, what about the solar system? What about the deep universe? What about exoplanets? And so you have to win not only in the panel, but you have to then have the be convincing enough that the panel chair will then go and say, you know what, we've got this, this thing that we just think we have to do with HST and everybody has to agree. So like anything that's done by consensus, um, it's a war, you know, the stuff that we give a, the time that is allocated is award winning because we have like gobs of award winning proposals, but something that's a little too edgy, you know, man, would not, you never know if it'll make it through or not. So. Yeah, well, it, it makes me wonder, you know, sometimes, you know, science breakthroughs are risky, and so you sometimes it's, it's, it's nice to, that that mechanism is in that place to do that. There is a mechanism in place to do that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. The, the other thing with the director's discretionary time proposals, they have to be timely. They have to actually require an observation that can't be proposed during part of that normal cycle of proposals. Was the New Horizons observations part of that? Was that something similar? So last summer we did um, a large survey for New Horizons looking for a candidate for the mission to visit after it makes its Pluto encounter this year. Um, Part of that time was director's discretionary time. So the director was um, up front early. He said, I think this is an interesting idea. I don't have enough time to do this full 180 orbit survey that they want to do. However, I can put 40 orbits into such an effort. And I'll tell you what, we'll put those 40 orbits in if the community as a whole through this peer review process thinks that the whole program is worthwhile. And what we'll do is we'll use those first 40 orbits to serve as a test. And so use those 40 orbits and essentially convince us that you will find what you think you'll find, right? Um, you don't have to find the exact object we're gonna go visit, but show us that such objects exist out there. And then if the if the time allocation committee has agreed that the whole program can go forward, we'll go forward with, with, with the whole program. So it was sort of like a little test test bed. So it was sort of a test bed, and even the, in that particular case, the director's time was contingent upon this buy-in from the whole time allocation committee. Now, the time allocation committee ranked the proposal very highly. They thought it was very risky, very challenging, but certainly something that would be very much worthwhile, given how long it takes for a probe to get to Pluto, and then obviously how long it would take for something to actually get beyond Pluto, that's not gonna happen in the next decade or maybe even the next two decades. So, you know, we've got one shot at it, and fortunately it does appear that there are some good candidate targets for, you know, for New Horizons to visit after it visits Pluto. Yeah, we uh, we had a hangout earlier in the uh, late last year on uh, on that release when it came out, where there was some targets suggested to the team, and I guess that the decision is uh, being considered, right? Yeah. Yes. So, ah, hello, Melissa McGrath is with us. Also, she was also a member of the panel that was uh, that has just uh, adjourned, uh, and uh, you were giving us a uh, uh, an overview of some of the Hubble discoveries of the solar system, correct? Yes. Yes. Thank you very so, much. Uh, so let me so let me ask you um, one of the things that was yeah you were coming. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> so uh, wait, I want it back. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the theme of this was, you know, what's Hubble done for us on, all o over 
all the, the time it's, it's been up there. And uh, what's your, like, if you could pick all of the things in, in planetary science that Humble has done, and you made the good point that before there were rubble, uh, all these rovers and spacecraft up there, Hubble was doing it way before it was cool, right? So uh, uh, what do you think the biggest contribution uh, Hubble has made to uh, our solar system, understanding our solar system? It's a tough pick question, five, five. but, um, <laughs> well, I, I, like I said in the panel, I do think the single overall biggest event was the Shoemaker Levy 9 impacts with Jupiter, but mm -hmm. that was just a spectacle, right? It was just an event that was incredible. Science wise, it, it's really hard to pick, but there are a few things that stand out for me. One is that before Hubble, um, the idea that there were companions to asteroids and things like Pluto, very small sort of borderline planetary things, was it was really not believed at all. And Hubble did, Hubble did, oh, you can't hear me. Okay Hubble did um, groundbreaking observations to look for multiple companions around asteroids. So that's one thing, and that really is completely changed our idea about asteroids and then of course the Galileo mission found you know small companions to asteroids um, I think also um, Aurora on the planets and satellites is another major area that it's really um, emission in the ultraviolet and you can't do it from the ground we were just talking about that with and Mark. so it's really the only uh, well <laughs> you can do it now from the ground in the infrared somewhat but um, it's just been a major area for Hubble on Jupiter, Saturn, and now also the satellites. Okay. So I'd pick those two. I don't it's, know. It's hard, there's probably there's more, a, but <laughs> there's a lot. That's true. So for being, uh, what is what's in the future for Hubble in terms of? Uh, do, are there any things planned for the future to, in, in in the solar system? Yeah. Oh, well, so um, one of the major things that happened in the last year was we think we found plumes from Europa. All right. And so there's a very large program this cycle to try to follow up on that. Um, and there's also a program to try to get more information on composition from Europa, which is basically pretty much completely lacking. And so it's sort of planning for a future mission as a potential target for habitability in the solar system. So that's one big thing. It's a large program that HST has to do that. Um, and there's also still a lot of work on um, a class of object that also, again, Hubble's been fundamental in um, working on, and that's they're called active asteroids. So there's now been a complete blurring between asteroids and comets. Yeah, I noticed that. So, yeah, and, and so that's an area that Hubble's made major contributions to, and I think will continue to make major contributions to for many years to come. So those are a couple examples. Yeah, yeah so. I'll add one to that, Tony. Um, just recently, a, an Outer Planets um, Atmospheric Monitoring Legacy Program was um, instituted. So in thinking about Hubble's... Wait, Outer Planets Legacy? Uh, outer Planet at Atmospheric Legacy. Atmospheric. So this is to look at um, Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn, uh, well, Saturn after Cassini is gone. And basically to monitor the weather or the atmosphere on those planets. Um, so th this kind of falls under that merging of the director's discretionary time we were talking about before. We were thinking, the director was asking, what kinds of things should Hubble be doing in its final years where it would be a real shame if, um, you know, if we missed the opportunity? That's a great question. And, and one, of the, one of the really interesting ideas or suggestions was, well, we have had, a, you know, through Hubble's lifetime, a relatively good record of monitoring the atmospheres of some of the giant planets in the solar system. And it would be a shame if we didn't continue that through the end of the mission. And you know, that will be a long a long lasting legacy of Hubble. Um, and so this is where they will revisit observations of these planets on some cadence, some some right. frequency? Right. So a few times a year um, there are observations made of the outer planets and um, they're looking for variability in the atmosphere, they're looking for features that arise, they're looking for um, you know just changes in overall um, the, the time variability of those atmospheres, which has been crucial in understanding how those weather systems evolve. And 
these are the kinds of planets that are being seen or will be seen around other stars. And so the thought is, if you don't understand the planets in our own solar system, how in the world do we ever have a chance of understanding what it is that we're seeing with even less information for planets around other stars? And so here we have perfect laboratories in our own solar system to do that kind of study and to, um, to take advantage of it. So, yeah. Well, uh, earlier when I was talking about you were talking you were talking about unexpected discoveries. I kind of diverted you onto the deep fields, but uh, I wanted to ask you: um, Do you have a a not necessarily a favorite? But what do you think was one of the more surprising things Hubble has done? You know what you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, certainly the exoplanet stuff, but the one that is my favorite, um, I'll surprise you because it isn't even an imaging observation. Um, Hubble was originally designed, one of the original key projects, the motivators for Hubble, was to understand the composition of that diffuse medium between galaxies, the intergalactic medium. And when Hubble was launched, it was thought that most of that medium was in the form of neutral hydrogen or ionized hydrogen and was relatively cool. Um, in the late 1990s, Hubble showed that in fact there's a very warm or even a hot million degree type component to that gap. A million degrees in between galaxies. In between galaxies. Uh, at least hundreds of thousands, maybe as much as a million degrees between galaxies. And this was found in um, a spectrum taken with the Goddard High Resolution Spectrograph by um, Ed Jenkins, Blair Savage, and Todd Tripp. And um, there's a characteristic signature in that spectrum that you that would be would be uh, evidence for that. Now it's interesting because that um, spectral signature is something that Lyman Spitzer and John Bacall and others had said might actually be present in the halos of galaxies. And so it started this whole cottage industry with Hubble of trying to determine whether or not that material is occurring in the big halos around galaxies or whether it's truly the intergalactic material. And it turns out it's some combination of the two. That was critical information for all these cosmological models that followed the evolution of galaxies from this gaseous structure at high redshift as it coalesces and forms along these streamers and eventually collapses into clusters of galaxies and then galaxies themselves. It's that cosmic web that thing we always see. That you've heard about. Um, it was crucial information for that at the lower redshifts. So it was a piece of information that hadn't been incorporated before, hadn't been realized was necessary before, and it changed the paradigm for how we think about how that whole hierarchical structuring and change from gas to galaxies occurs. It was a very cool observation. Yeah. And, and, and completely unexpected. No one, no one. And really unexpected, yeah. Wow, that is amazing. But I think it's, so a million degree gas in between the galaxies but the gas is extremely it's rarefied, really right? Really rarefied. We're talking, what, atoms, on, a few atoms here and there? It's even, per some unit it's space? It's even worse than that. Okay. So, you, you know, you, ha you have to sample, you know, in a, in, a, oh geez, in a room the size of this hall here that we're in, which is huge, maybe there are a few thousand atoms. I mean, uh, you know, in, in, in a square, in a cubic centimeter, there's, uh, you know, what is it? It's, a billion billion a atoms or molecules, right? And y you know, you could take that, you could take the air in this room and stretch it all the way to Andromeda, you know, to the next big galaxy out there, and that would be about the the, the density, rarefication yeah. and the density of a gas between galaxies. Yeah. It's incredibly. You could count them as you go by. Yeah. Well, the reason, <laughs> and I only learned that because I started my career in solar physics, and one of the first questions I ever got was, "How come the sun? If the sun is a 55." Uh, 100 degrees Kelvin, the, the, and how could the corona be 2 million degrees? Yeah, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I had to, I was like, uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, and that's why I learned the answer to that one <laughs> pretty quickly. So, uh, so Melissa, what, what was your impression? Um, uh, did you get some interesting questions at the panel or things that, that, you, uh, that you thought was particularly interesting? Well, I got asked about Shoemaker Levy 9 because I didn't talk about it. So Ron okay. Cowan asked me that. Um, and I, I don't I don't even remember what else. I think we talked too much. We didn't leave a lot of time for questions. Yeah, but I'm not no. sure. I'm not sure there were a lot of questions either, though. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, so that was the biggest question oh, I got. Okay. Well, the uh, so th of the were there any unexpected things that w in in the field of the solar system that you would feel that, that, that Hubble maybe showed us that we we didn't know might have been a, a, a 
an issue or, you know, anything that we learned completely surprised us? Well, I mean, many of the things we've already mentioned, the impacts with Jupiter, right? I, I, seeing a comet that had been split into a bunch of pieces, I think that was actually a complete surprise to people. Um, this, the phenomena on the satellites, I think, too, the, the giant planet satellites, I think, has been pretty unexpected. So they're, they're very interesting. They have very tenuous exospheres. Um, they have plumes, clouds, all sorts of things that I don't think people ever really thought we'd be able to observe with Hubble. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually have a question about the impacts on Jupiter because I'm not a solar system astronomer, as Melissa well knows. So my impression from way out here was that when these imp the possibilities the impacts or the impact was seen in the possibility that they could have been common in the past, sort of changed the role of Jupiter in the solar system, and that translated into looking at exoplanet systems and what is the role of the Jovian and Neptune-sized planets in either protecting or disrupting the formation or protecting the already formed solar system. Am I right about that? It started yeah. out that picture? I think so. I mean... I was, in thinking, preparing for this panel, I, I have to say one of the other areas that our thinking has just radically changed in the last 10 years has been exoplanets has really given us a totally different view of our own solar system. We used to think that every other solar system would look like ours, right? We thought it'd have a Jupiter, and, and now we know that's completely untrue. And I think you're right, Carol, that the impacts sort of made us think more about how these giant planets influence a system and they have a tremendous influence the the planets migrate and totally different kinds of architectures are possible and that's what we see now and so i i don't think that people really even though i think we could have understood that we just didn't we we think we, what we see now we tend to think that's the way everything is and we're always surprised I don't know why we always get surprised it's never that way but you know it, it'll be like flying by Pluto right I predict there'll be things that are just completely unexpected and so that's the beauty of it yeah I suppose if I had to pick a favorite thing my, my favorite thing that Hubble's ever done was the, the original uh, 95 uh, deep field but the uh, it, I, I made a video called the most important image ever taken that's how strongly it affected me but the the uh, the, when it comes to the solar system, um, my favorite thing has been the discoveries that Hubble has done with the moons of Pluto. I mean, they found moons that no one knew were there. Couldn't no other no other telescope could do that, and even made crude and temperature. And debate of Pluto as a planet. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Pluto used to be a planet when Hubble was launched. Yeah, right. right. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Hubble's mm, yeah. settled that question. Well, but gave us a view of the the that part of the solar system, like how much. I mean know that there's stuff out there but what is it so just going, just going back to melissa's comment though and in response to your question wouldn't it be interesting if in fact we find that in exoplanet systems even in cases where there's an earth-like planet in a habitable zone you don't actually see any evidence for life unless there's a jupiter or a large planet protecting it oh i know one of that that would be really cool I think that would be an amazing uh, thing to find. Um, one of the things that I, I find fundamentally important question I've always wanted to answer, and I talk to evolutionary biologists about this all the time, is is, the, is, is going from a planet that's basically just has, is dead, has no life, like the, the early Earth, how hard is it to go from primordial soup and ooze and, and amino acids and stuff to something that's alive? How hard is that step? No one knows, uh, but my, but one way to find out will be with these upcoming missions of JWST and with the contributions of Hubble, is if we find that life is common in the universe, then we know that that step probably isn't very hard. But if there are, we don't if we don't find it anywhere, it's probably very hard to do that. And that's something that I've always been extremely interested in. And uh, the the observations of uh, these exoplanets coming in future missions are very exciting to me for that reason. So, and, and when it comes to Hubble, or Pluto, though, we it, Hubble also made. What, were they temperature maps, or what kind of map? They made a map of. We were surface. Um Reflectance. So what's reflected off the surface and what we found is, just like Hubble found actually, you may not remember, on Titan, 
So Hubble also discovered that there were b bright and dark areas on Titan, and it, you know, it, it sees as Pluto rotates, its brightness changes, and you can map that out with lots of observations. And so there are now pretty detailed mo models of what the surface looks like, the surface reflectance just looks like. Changes yes, as yep. it rotates. So it's just reflectance, and and almost always, you know, how it reflects is is indicative of composition or Feature, you know maybe. land versus ocean right. or things like that right. clouds and so it's telling us something fundamental about pluto mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't know what yet yeah. we'll find out <laughs> yeah well that's another exciting thing that's happening this coming year right there'll be a point i think it's in february and i think we're going to have a hangout on this uh hopefully <laughs> we'll plan one uh, where there will be a time when new horizons as it approaches will be giving us more detailed uh, images of Pluto than, than the, the most detailed so far, which have been provided by Hubble. So I think that happens sometime in February. Of course, it gets to uh, Pluto in July, I believe, mm -hmm. correct? That's yeah. Right. So, yeah, so Hubble is always setting the stage for things that are always that are coming and helping us answer questions, uh, or helping other missions uh, know what questions to even ask, you know? It's kind of really cool. Uh, any final thoughts? You guys want to add anything uh, that, about the panel, the future of what? The, oh, no, Ken, I got to ask you this. Come on, man. I got. I got the mission head here. I got to ask him. Just a few minutes. Uh, no, no, I mean, oh. how much longer will Hubble last? Oh, no, no. I want you to tell us the, the current status of Hubble. How is Hubble? Uh, how's it doing? Uh, every, 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 do, any danger signs? Is this, anything like that? No, so uh, that's a great question. Um, Hubble is better than it's ever been, and it's operating extremely well. So we, at the moment, don't have any concerns about the health. Um, or the future of the observatory, and we really do believe that it should be possible to operate Hubble at least out to 2020 and to have a year or more of overlap with James Webb. So it's, it's working really well. The last servicing mission um, really did a fantastic job of preparing the telescope, not just for the first five years after the mission, but you know for the, for the next five years of the decade here to come. I got a question from someone that I didn't know the answer to. Now that I have you here, I will ask you. In the last servicing mission, SM9, we basically rebuilt Hubble with new detectors, new cameras, and we put new gyros in. Uh, was any of the underlying electronics uh, upgraded, like, say, the, uh, the computer or the storage systems? or Were any of those things upgraded as well? No, so not on the spacecraft side. Oh, well, not on the spacecraft side. In the instrument payloads side, um, there were some electronics um, for the computer that controls the instruments, that talks directly to the instruments. That's the um, Science Instrument C Control and Data Handling Unit. That was replaced. And in fact, that was a last minute addition to the manifest for the mission, for the servicing mission, because the um, old one that was in there actually had an electronics failure, you know, about a year before the servicing mission was supposed to occur. And it was realized that if you, you know, the instruments are taking data, but you can't talk to right. the instruments. While you're up there. <laughs> exactly. So that, that, that's, the, that's the module that um, the commands to operate the instruments flow through, as well as the data once the instruments take it, flows back through that, that whole module. And you need to have that working. So that, that was one major upgrade. Um, the two instruments that were repaired, the Advanced Camera for Surveys and the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, did receive some new electronics. Um, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, um, the, the astronauts went right into the instrument and replaced one of the faulty um, uh, electronics boards that was in there. And in the case of the Advanced Camera for Survey, they put an additional box on the outside of the instrument and rerouted the internal electronics path to the outside into that box. So now both of those instruments have actually operated longer on those repaired electronics than they did previously on the original electronics. Good to know. Uh, okay, so another question I get a lot is we, this thing was designed in the 70s, built in the 80s, launched in the 90s. What, how powerful are the computers on there? Are they from, are they 70s, 80s era computers, or, or what are they? We, the, the main spacecraft computer that we, was launched was with a 386. <laughs> we, now, we now have 486, you know, during oh, the- got a 486 on uh, During the servicing mission back, uh, I forget if it was three, 3A or 3B that put in, it must have been 3A that put in the, uh, the 486. But it, but it's a, but it's a, yeah, it's less than the iPad yeah, or your yeah, iPhone. But then again, your iPad or your iPhone wouldn't survive too long in space. It's not a radiation hardened device. So. As you all know, that 
my iPad doesn't it, even survive the downpour. It, 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 is, it is a testament <laughs> to the Hubble team that they've been able to operate Hubble with such a computer and the limitations that we have both for computing power as well as storage on board, um, memory as well as storage for the data itself. Um, and yet we, we, don't, we don't even fully utilize the capabilities of that particular computer. So Hubble is a, um, Hubble is a remarkable machine. It does remarkable things with, you know, with technology that isn't all that advanced in some cases. Some, you want it to be as simple as possible, I would imagine, right? Yeah. So, um, uh, the uh, let me ask Elena. Elena, are there any questions from YouTube or uh, any any place? Okay, one question from Mary on YouTube. What is the most eye? This is to you, Ken. What is the most eye-opening thing you knew about before it was released to the public? I guess he wants to know how, how, what kind of salacious uh, gossip you have. I, I was going to say, that, that's a, a veiled request to tell them what the 25th anniversary image yeah. is going to be, isn't it? <laughs> who, who is yeah. this Mary person? <laughs> yeah, who is this Mary person? Um, actually, I see most of the... Mary Zecker. Mary Zecker. Mary, I see most of the results uh, when they come out, just like you do. Um, I'm, I'm not... I'm not actually, yeah, Carol, Carol's the one for real. Carol. We don't, um, you know, we, we obtain the data, we process the data, we calibrate it, we archive it, but we're not um, examining it from a science standpoint. So a lot of times it does take um, some time for the scientists to figure out what's going on. Now that having been said, um, we do have some advanced insight into all of the press releases for Hubble that come out. Um, you know, we, we, keep a, we keep track of all that and we know what's coming. Um, so you, you could, the answer to that could be everything or nothing, depending on how you want to interpret that response. Yeah, doing these hangouts has let me go into some of the, a lot of the press, uh, press meetings and it's really fun to see what's coming up. So it's really, really exciting stuff. I will say, I will say what, it's not the most, or, but I was impressed that when we did the frontier fields, we had a supernova in the, the first cluster. Yeah. I, I thought that was very cool. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, secret or anything, but we're taking these observations and all of a sudden it's like, what's that? Oh, cool. Yeah. It's like, so that, that was pretty I, exciting. I, th I think one, one other thing that was just tremendously exciting was when the advanced camera for surveys was installed and the first early release observations for that came out. And you could see how much better, better that camera was than what the previous generation cameras were able to produce and you realize then that that was just a new observatory and that was fantastic and it's been much the same with the wide field camera 3 with its infrared channel yeah. a lot of the things that we see there it, it's eye-opening every time you look because it's a different view of the universe that we haven't really had before in that kind of detail and I'm gonna go. I'm I'm gonna ask one more question that I always get a lot from just the general public is there is there any way do you think, in your opinion, this is a, an opinion question, that we would ever be able to save Hubble or get it and bring it back? Um, I think bringing it back to Earth uh, in a way that it could be put into a museum is probably not within the realm of feasibility at this point. Um, so no, I don't, I, unfortunately that capability was lost uh, with the shuttles, and in fact, it was lost before the shuttle program was terminated. It was lost when Columbia, the Columbia accident occurred because Columbia was the last shuttle that could have returned Hubble safely to Earth because the airlock was on the inside of the, uh, of the uh, payload bay. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So that, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Enough room. There, and and so that, Hubble would not have fit in the other, uh, in the other shuttles at the time. Pieces. <laughs> so they would have had to really fit, really, really yeah. modify the shuttle to be able to. I did not know that. Okay, and in and as I've always said in these hangouts, John Grunsfeld left a little black ring on there in the hopes, but I guess even robotic missions not even. Well, the, that ring is on there to somehow um, grab it and to do something with it at some point. Um, Hubble will not re-enter the Earth's atmosphere for quite a long time. I mean, the best estimates are that it would still be you know, up there even in the early 2030s. Oh, really? I had heard 2025 might be the time when it starts to decay. I think that's about the time that we really have to start thinking about what to do. Uh, maybe you even want to think about a little bit before, because right now NASA does have a requirement that, uh, you know, it, the, 
they say disposal, it'd be disposed of properly. Now disposal could mean bringing it back into Earth in a controlled manner so that it burns up and re-enters over the Pacific Ocean, for example, as opposed to over land. It could also mean boosting it into a higher orbit so that it just basically stays up there forever. Um, which, you know. I wouldn't object to that. I was going to say, I think is a palatable suggestion for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, because it has become, you know, everybody's telescope. I mean, it, the people's telescope, we've called it that all the time. And for and 25 years, it's going to, it's unprecedented. And I don't, I don't, I don't see any, when I learn about all these missions coming up, I don't see them lasting 25 years. Do you? I mean, the, you know, JWST's got a limited time and all these other ones. Right. So probably not, given that they don't have the servicing capability that Hubble had. And so there was that intimate connection between the manned program and Hubble that, hasn't really existed except in very limited ways for other for other missions and certainly hasn't uh, been planned for the missions that are coming up like James Webb. And I think that'll ensure Hubble in our memories for uh, forever. I mean I just think that'll really be an indelible make an indelible mark uh, on humanity because of its length of time being up there. Melissa thank you very much. Oh wait another qu I'm sorry you had another question. Go ahead. And Andrew Planet. Hi Andrew. I know you from G plus, I'll bet. Why? Why not park Hubble somewhere until we have the capability to bring it down? And that's what Ken was just addressing. He was saying that we we could perhaps uh, push it up into a higher orbit where it just stays forever. Um, but I, no one's or plan. Or is NASA thinking about this yet? Or NASA and the Goddard Space Flight Center are in fact thinking about that and. Um there have been some initial studies done as to what the best thing to do would be. And so, you know, the, the various options are on the table, and there hasn't been a particular option selected. I mean, but I guess there's time, so we have sure. some time to think about it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions, Elena? Okay. Okay. John Hobbs. Not, not that it matters in space, but I wonder... I know, I know Hubble is as big as this bus, but how heavy is it? It's about 24,000 pounds. So way heavier than a bus. So way heavier than a bus, exactly. Awesome. If you were to bring it back to Earth, that's about what it would weigh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, got, I always comment on this. I saw it my first... It not weigh anything. It's in orbit. Oh, well, that's... Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, when I was when I went down to Kennedy and I looked at the Atlantis exhibit, they have a full scale model of the Hubble right next to it, and that's when I was blown away by you know we always say it's the size of a school bus, but school buses are pretty darn big. I mean that's a big <laughs> telescope. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to stop it there. I want to thank you, Ken. Thank you very much for joining us in the Hangout, Melissa. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. All right, I want to thank you all for watching. Our next Hangout will happen. What time is it, Carol? Oh my gosh, eight minutes. Uh, we're gonna, Carol and I are going to do a wrap-up uh, of the day's events, but we're also going to give you a quick glimpse at the uh, uh, new mass archive. If you've ever wanted to learn how to get Hubble data, and I know you do, uh, there's, we've got an easier way to get it coming up. So we're going to show you just a little bit what we're showing in the booth here uh, and give you a little glimpse, and then it'll be released later, later uh, this year. In a couple, uh, I think they're saying February. So come back in a few minutes. We'll be set up again and uh, doing another Hangout. Thank you all for watching. I'm Tony Darnell, as always. Um, and then what we have to do to actually match our science goals to what their budget might be. So they always give us a little bit of advice about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so NASA's, this isn't the part that deals with human space flight, for example. So they don't talk about Orion or they don't talk about any of that, any, or, you know, uh, Earth science or the space station, things like that. It's just the astrophysics division and the priorities there, of which JWST falls under uh, the purview Hubble Space Telescope does. Um, and now they're starting to get to thinking about what's going, W first is the next thing after JWST. That's the big mission. We talked about that in the hangout earlier today. And now they're talking about what's coming next. And they're thinking about this what at last or high definition. Well, I, th I think the big thing for me, I, when I'm over in the States, I like to come to these events because it, it's good to get an idea of what NASA is thinking. Because I work with the European Space Agency. Right. And what we need to try to do is join up the thinking, yeah. which we haven't, if we're honest, done that well in the past. Uh, and when things get so expensive uh, as we're going for bigger missions, 
we've got to collaborate more to share the costs out so that we can do the science that we really want to do. So I think the, the headline was the planning for the next decadal survey, which seems a long way away because it's only 2015 it's right now. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, but, it, but it's putting in the legwork so that when that comes around in five years' time, the appropriate large projects, uh, of which I hope at last or high definition space telescope will be one, are actually at a, a better stage of preparation because if we do nothing between now and then, then there'll be nothing to look at and to evaluate for that decadal survey. And therefore, it'll be another decade before these missions get a chance. And then these, it gets well, well beyond the lifetime of my career. <laughs> Uh, and possibly others. So it really is important to get that planning in place and get the exercise done. Yeah, and uh, what NASA did today, or at least what Paul Hertz in his presentation did today, was he outlined big picture boxes that he would that he wanted these projects to uh, to fall in. This project, whatever it ended up being, uh, they, the, the, what they were looking for. What did you think of that? There were a lot of synoptic things, a lot of exoplanets, things like that. Yeah. They're, they're, a lot of it seems to be focused on surveys as well, and I, yeah, I, yeah. surveys are really important, but I, I'm not entirely convinced in my own head that the next large NASA mission should be a survey. But it does depend what you mean by survey. Do you mean a survey of things that you already know about or a survey to discover new things? Uh, certainly the, the idea of at last fulfills probably two of the things that were actually suggested. The imaging of terrestrial exoplanets is certainly something that's within the capabilities of that. But then there was a separate uh, category for UV optical IR survey. But without saying much about what that was, I mean, again, at last fulfills that role. One of the things that I was a bit concerned about, there was also a big X-ray survey. And since those of us in Europe... That was one of the boxes he had outlined, an X-ray survey. Yeah. I've just basically put Athena on the line as the next large ESA mission uh, towards the end of the next decade. That seems to be a bit of... Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the another Hangout, another or live Hubble Hangout at the um, American Astronomical Society's 225th meeting. Today, we are at the Space Telescope Science Institute booth, and we are going to talk about Hubble, uh, the some of the unexpected discoveries, some of the things that Hubble has given us, some of the things that we didn't expect to see from Hubble and things like that. And, and there, these are members of a panel that's going on actually right now uh, where they're talking about these things. We're going to have some members of the panel come down and join us. But unfortunately, like I said, the panel's running a little bit late. So they haven't gotten down here yet. And so uh, we had the very good luck, however, of uh, Mart actually, uh, poor, poor Martin. Mar Dr. Mar Doc Dr. Martin Star Barstow from the Royal Astronomical Society had stopped by our booth to say hi to us. And then I said, <laughs> I said, hey, why don't you come talk to us? You may remember he was in a hangout early, or late last year where he talked to us about um, the ATLAS mission, or which is now being called the High Def Space Telescope, High Definition Space Telescope uh, mission that was going on or is being planned right now. Um, so before I get started, I want to remind you that we're looking if you want to ask questions, Hubble Hangout is the hashtag to use on Twitter. We're also doing it on YouTube, or the YouTube event page, or the YouTube page where this is being broadcast. We're looking at your comments as well as the G Plus event page that we posted this on. So please send some questions in or comments, and we will read them. I have a person in my ear, Elena. She's awesome, telling me uh, what you're saying. So uh, I, I will repeat them in the Hangout and uh, read them out to you, and hopefully get some answers. So, and also with me is Dr. Carol Christian from the Space Telescope Science Institute as well. She's the Hubble Outreach Scientist. Hi, Carol. Hey. Okay, so Martin, I know you were, you just, you just <laughs> flew in. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I apologize for the jet lag. <laughs> yeah. But it's, this, is, this is a little bit fortuitous because earlier today, at around noon, uh, 1230, I think, uh, NASA had their big town hall, and they outlined all of their budgets and, and what they're uh, working on and the status of a variety of things and, and where things lie in this. It was mostly the science mission directorate, though, right, Carol? Yes, yes. That's the main audience here is the astrophysics part is, is best tuned to the audience at the Ast uh, American Astronomical Society. Right. So they always come and tell us what they're thinking. 